George, are you there? Are you letting people in? Yep, coming in now. Awesome, man. Okay, I'm just getting set up here. Q participants. Uh, okay, getting all my little windows put over here. So everybody, uh, I can see you're all coming in right now. It's exciting to have you. This is gonna be a really fun call. Um, uh, Sam is, I really wanna do a call on what the, what the bleep, but really it turned into a call on quantum physics, but then you also got some uh, uh, biology in there when you understand and you got um, uh, relativity and you got, you got all these different aspects of how we create consciousness in the world. And it's kind of a discussion of, of how the world works or how we perceive that it works from the current uh, sciences that are out there, quantum physics being a big one. Um, and uh, so I was super excited to do this because I love abstract reasoning and I love breaking down how things work. And that's what that, that you know, on the subtlest level and the tiniest level. And so it becomes a real deep dive. And um, there's that whole comment in, in the movie, What the Bleep, you know, how far down the rabbit hole do you want to go? Because if you, on, on a surface level, everything looks so set. But as you go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into things, you really get this feeling that nothing, that, that everything is malleable. And this is how thought creates reality, which we talk about on these webinars all the time. Your mind is creating your reality. So we're gonna get deeper into the science of that, um, not the metaphysics. We talk from the metaphysics perspective, chakras and stuff sometimes, but we're gonna talk about the science today uh, that's out there and you know and debatable, just like, just like everything else. So uh, hopefully you guys uh, have a little bit of experience with this. If not, we'll be, uh, we'll be educating you. And I'm super curious to see what Sam's come up with. And I'm super curious to add a little bit of insights I've come up with because it definitely, when, when I was watching, re-watching What the Bleep for the who knows how many time, I just see there's so many overlaps in the new thought movement in spirituality and metaphysics. It's just amazing to me, the amount of overlaps and, uh, and how when people go to this level and start studying at this level, they really begin to believe that consciousness exists that we do create our own reality and consciousness do ex does exist on, on a, on a multi-dimensional level and it gets really, really crazy. So Sam, you want to jump in here and take over a little bit and then, um, and then I'll just come in and comment here and there and talk with you. Maybe we'll have a conversation here and there, but go for it, man. Absolutely. Um, Cause there's the danger in this kind of conversation is that it becomes esoteric and not something that we can actually use and wrap our, we can wrap our heads around the concepts, but how do we, create in our world. So, and the, the, the opening of the movie, by the way, this, uh, the movie is called What the Bleep Do We Know? Uh, and if someone could throw up a, it's a powerful sort of documentary on exactly what Brian's talking about. The first thing one of the, the physicists says is quantum physics is the, is the physics of possibilities. And that's what we do here at Fearless is create uh, and openings for all the possibilities which go beyond your very limited possibility of who you are, either with women or how you are in the world, with your friends or with money. So I, if anybody wants to listen from the sense of the freedom of possibility and the power of being the chooser, that's what this call is about, ideally. Yeah, or not being the chooser, depending on how, because that was another thing he alluded to, right, was that you are capable of being the chooser, but most people aren't because we identify so much with our memories that we are just constantly recreating our past through our memories. And so we are creating our future. We're just creating the same future over and over. Right. Right. And that's, a, that's an interesting perspective too. So there's all these possibilities and you keep choosing the same damn one. And that's uh, and so how does all this work? How do we, how do, how are all like, it's fascinating because to me in quantum physics says there's an endless number of possibilities. How does all that work? Well, I'm not a physicist, uh, nor am I a You're talking from layman's theory. terms. If there's a physicist <laughs> on the call, you can throw in some comments here and there. Well, you know, um, uh, years ago, uh, someone told me that the, what the definition of an expert is, and an expert is someone who knows a little bit more about something than most people. So, and I found that really liberating. I don't have to be an expert to have a point of view. Uh, on something that I've studied that maybe somebody else has not. So that's really- Sam, I'm going to give you, a, 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 I'm going to tell you right now, you understand a lot more than the average person. You think you <laughs> understand a little bit more, but you understand a lot. You've done a lot of work on understanding of the mind, how it works. And 
I can really have these deep conversations with you about abstract stuff that I can't have with other people. You have a pretty deep awareness when it comes to this stuff. So let's let it roll. Yeah. You know, one of the most uh, uh, powerful parts was when that uh, fellow was talking about um, when you look at, when you look at something, it is a wave. Now, when you don't look at it, it appears as a wave. And when you do, it appears as a particle. Yeah, the that double slit. Away. What's that? The double slit experiment. Double slit experiment. And that just blew, that just blew my mind, which means there are, we are the chooser based on our experience based on our, uh, our memories, based on whatever is going on inside of us, we are the choosers amongst limitless possibilities in the world because science, uh, quantum physics is about possibilities. Yeah. Um, and it's really started to break down for me. I was reading this cool book, The Tao, the Tao of Physics. And it talks about how quantum modern physics and Eastern mysticism are bringing science and religion together. And he talks about Descartes in the, whatever, the 16th century said that um, the, um, uh, uh, I think therefore I am. And that was a whole time in history when we had, there was, uh, in other words, your mind is separate from your body. Your mind is separate from your reality. It was a very powerful thought at the moment, but that was in a time when we were, when uh, I think Newton was somewhere around that time. The Catholic Church was putting God as separate from us. Everything was separate. Everything was cause and effect. It was, um, uh, what's the word, a mechanistic way of looking at the world. But if you look back at the Greeks, when they were talking about physis, which is where physics comes from, this is the study of possibilities of who you are internally. And they wrapped religion, philosophy, and science all in the same place. So now here we are where quantum physics is suggesting that we don't know what we think we know and it's ever evolving. And while it feels like chaos sometimes, it is the thought that there are limitless possibilities in front of us and we only see the one that we see is a mind blower to me. I mean, and I love the Descartes quote because uh, I've always heard it. I've always heard it corrected. I mean, I mean, many years ago, I can't remember who corrected it first, but it was instead of I think, therefore I am, it's I am, therefore I think. Um, because yeah. if you get in deep meditation, you realize you can steal your thoughts and yet you don't go anywhere. And so therefore thought is not you. Thought is an experience that you have. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about this stuff so people understand. How does science, like this idea that we have limitless possibilities is great, but how do we prove that on a literal level? And science took, took this double slit experiment and showed that this is literally that we have, we have we, that consciousness comes in the form of a wave or light comes in the form of a wave. We start with light back in the, it was the 1800s. And they showed how light moves in the form of a wave till they introduce an observer and then solidifies itself into a small particle. So the wave is... Is, is literally rolling out everywhere. No observer, an ocean of possibilities is, is flowing. Then the observer looks at it and immediately comes into form and takes a form. And they show this scientifically, this principle, because there was a whole argument, right, of that the, the, whether light was a wave or a particle and somebody was trying to prove that. And then that's how this came to be. So do you want to talk about that? Boy, I don't have an answer for that. I, it, I think that's something to meditate on. And that it's... Um... No, do you remember? Do you know what the original experiment was? Um, yeah, uh, the double the double slit. Yeah, where two things could be in one place, uh, two different places at the same time. Well, that's the yeah the entanglement part. That's the that's yeah. the wave because the wave is spreading out. It's one wave entangling, right? Right. Um, but so they, the double slit, they they took uh, particles of light and they 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 put two slits in like a. You can do it through cardboard, two slits through cardboard, and you run particles of light. And because a particle is, is a particle of mass, the theory is that you would, you would create two slits on the other side, basically. But, but, and so they would do that, and then what would happen is they get an interference pattern. It's like two waves going out rather than, than two particles. So particles will create two lines. Waves create this expanding out energy. And then when, wherever the waves hit each other, 
they cancel each other out and they create an interference pattern, which is a bunch of lines. So they were saying, wait a minute, these particles are spreading out and they should create two lines, but they're creating five lines. And then and they're, and they're spreading out from there and creating more and more infinite possibilities because they're spreading out everywhere. So then they took another experiment and they wanted to see literally what the particles were doing. And somehow they were able to put, a, I think it was a camera on the particle itself and, and film it. And as soon as they did that, the particle, because of the observ observation, I don't see camera how they did it, the particle stayed two lines. It didn't go into wave pattern because of the observer. The observer caused it to take a form and hold that form. When the observer wasn't there, it would split, it would spread out and, and make all these lines and potentiality. So they began to realize, so that whole argument it, it, that they were literally proving scientifically, if we're not in the forest to see the tree fall, does the tree actually fall? And then is there even a forest if we're not, if there's no observer there? There's no observer. Does anything exist when we're not there? And this is at the quantum level, it kind of, it's just, it doesn't exist. It's pools of energy that we bring into form through consciousness. So that, that's the way I took it. So, yeah, well, that's the, the, the then the question is to bring this down to what, what the guys might, I'm really curious what the questions are around all this because the question does come down to who, who is the observer? Mm -hmm. I, I had a, did an ex interesting experiment this week in meditation where according to old views of the world that we are, if I am, if my thoughts are thinking about um, a chair, the chair is not me because you can't be the observer and the chair at the same time. So now if you meditate on your thoughts and your thoughts are things, um, you can get lost in that thing uh, believing it's true, your thought, like whatever my limiting thought about myself is. Or you can take the next step, which is being, is what we teach, is being the observer of your experience. Observing yourself thinking about the, the thing, the thought. Now, if you're observing yourself thinking, then you are not your thought about yourself. You can't be. It's just mathematics. Now you are the observer, so now you're two things. But I took it a step further. I think I, I can't remember where I learned this. True awareness, true enlightenment, even if it's for a moment, is being aware of your awareness, is observing your observing. And when I've done this, it's like I get a jolt of electricity through my body. Because I am completely, not, it's, I would describe it as now I'm in the seat of consciousness, of observing my own ob observation. So I, so my observance, my observance of the thought isn't me either. And you can probably keep going back and back and back, observing your observing of your observing. Well, it's consciousness becoming aware of itself and starting to observe itself is the is the true awakening, as you just put it. It's true enlightenment. That's when we we begin to really truly awaken. It. Because no animal is sitting there observing its own thoughts and then observing itself, observing its thoughts. And we're the only one that does that. Um, and that's when life becomes freaky. So then that makes me think of uh, the one thing I that every guy who comes through our doors, or all clients seem to have one thing when it comes to women, which is, uh, why don't you approach her? What do they all say? I'd be bothering her. Hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. And I'm totally fall. Sam, you're frozen. Is, is Sam frozen or am I frozen? I don't think I am, but uh, anybody, hey, can somebody, Josh, are you there? Yeah, Sam's frozen. Okay, I'm sure he'll come back in a minute. You start uh, observing that thought of, I Sam, you're gone for a while. You were gone for the last minute. Yeah, oh, the last minute? Yeah, well, you, as soon as you said something about a guy uh, says he doesn't want to, he doesn't want to approach, or because he doesn't want to bother her, then you, you were gone. Yeah. So that is that. This basically is that we are making up reality for somebody else. And I remember um, hanging out with Johnny uh, Soporno years ago with Violet, his girlfriend, and she was hearing me talk about that, and she got upset with me. She goes, "How dare you make up a reality for me?" Mm -hmm. And that was like, oh my God, I am taking full responsibility for everybody's reality. It's, it's, it's very interesting how people want you to take, and I've, ha I've experienced that before, 
in dating how some women want me to take up responsibility for their reality. And some women get really upset when you do. Um, when I was early on, I had a coach, a trainer, who said he was he was really young and he picked up this girl and took her home and she was a little older than him. And, and after he had sex with her, he was like, you know, I just want to tell you, you know, I'm not looking for anything serious. I felt like I needed to have the talk because we just had sex. And she laughed at me and said, oh, little man. And she goes, she goes, did I say anything about wanting to make you my boyfriend because I took you home to have sex? That's, you know, and I realized how condescending to even assume that every, that the moment, because she wants to go home with me, that she immediately wants to be like, I'm, I'm putting all this projection onto her. And he goes, oh. so I needed this, I needed to figure a way around that. So then I remember him saying that. And then I went out with this girl, had sex with her. And I was like telling her the next day, I know it. And she got so mad at me, just like this woman. And I was like, wow. She's like, why are we, why are you even bringing this up? That's fruit. And I was like, interesting. So I really is a projection and, and she took it personal that I would assume. And then another girl that I didn't, so I didn't do that to this, this next girl. And the next girl was like, why didn't you tell me you didn't want a relationship when we started? And I was like, interesting. Now she wants me to take responsibility. Like, I was like, why didn't you ask me right up front? You know, and as a two-way, so there was this whole, like, everybody's got their own little reality and they project life through it. And we're all just mad. the thing we're talking about infinite possibilities there when you've been it's kind of fun taking it right down to talking about girls mm -hmm. <laughs> there are infinite possibilities of what that girl wants and infinite possibilities of what you want you only see the possibility say is i'm bothering her and if you choose that possibility or you choose that reality and you go talk to a girl you will bother her yes yes yeah, because the brain is processing it according, I've heard so many different statistics, uh, 4 million, 10 million bits of data, uh, uh, ex, uh, no, uh, 10 million to 40 million bits of data per second, but um, the Spinza says it's like 400 billion, he says some, something ridiculous, but the, 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 the brain, but the conscious mind only sees a fraction of that, and so the, the mind can pick up on the exact feeling, if you have the feeling I'm bothering her, the subconscious mind knows how to get you to behave in a way through all those billions of bits of data per second to bother her and you won't even know what you did because it'll be little tiny 1% here, 1% there, 1% here, 1% there to cause the exact reaction to come back at you and create that reality. I've seen it in students over and over and over again. Over and over. As we become more confident, in my life. Yeah, go for it, sorry. I, no, I see it in my own life um, constantly. What I choose to see, what I choose to experience is what I experience. And that becomes a self-feeding loop over mm -hmm. and over and over again. I often talk about my friend who was, uh, loves to travel and he has a fear of being conned and swindled. So he, uh, uh, when he travels, because he has this fear and he looks for it everywhere, who does he attract? Con men and swindlers. It yeah. happens over and over and over again. And it feeds his belief system with see this is real. And then by making it real, it becomes real. And it just reinforces his belief system over and over and over again. Yeah, when I first started dating, I drew bipolar girls one after another. Um, I have met people that have been robbed at an ATM five or six times. I met people, one girl uh, was a, a student at my old teacher's uh, class. And she would walk to the class miles and they, somebody asked, why do you walk here? And she says, because I get in car accidents when I get in cars. And they said, well, why don't you take a taxi? And she goes, because the taxis crash too. It's happened to me. This is not <laughs> riding cars anymore. I, I walk everywhere. And, and, um, and so their, their, their subconscious is figuring out how to bring this into reality over and over and over again. Um, poverty is contagious. You, you, you get a certain, maybe you're just above broke and you stay just above broke your whole life because you don't change that internal reality. Um, and if we relate this back to the quantum physics again, and we look at what like all these teachers are saying, like, um, like Fred Allen Wolf, which is a quantum physicist, and you look at like um, Joe Dispenza, which is a neuroscientist, and you look at Hagelin, which is another physicist, and Hagelin discovered unified field theory, is that we all are creating our own reality through these potentialities, that at the, at the quantum level, everything is basically soup or jello as Taggart says is jello and it's an unformed and it's coming in and out of form. What creates the form moves it from wave to particle is our thinking and our emotions. And as soon as we attach thinking and emotion, 
just like a wave in the ocean, a ripple comes up and takes a form, and then we and then we experience that form. As soon as we fix it into the subjective mind, the the, the feminine mind, the subconscious mind, and it becomes a permanent neural pathway running over and over. I have this experience, and now you don't even have to think about it anymore because it's part of your subconscious now. It's programmed. That wave will pop up every time you look in that direction. That possibility shows up, and then you swear that's reality. You are going to prove this is how the world works. But yet there's still somebody else having a different reality out there. And because they're, they're pulling from that soup, that primordial soup, the jello or the unified field theory or the, uh, uh, the zero point theory, as Taggart says, they're pulling up in the form from a different set of memories and experiences from life. And uh, those are attractor fields. So those attractor fields then pull in science. Uh, we, we attach to 10 attractor fields proving that reality is fixed and we can't change it. Well, you have a, you're gonna have a really hard time changing your reality because you've got 10 different fields of beliefs that you've plugged into that say reality is fixed and you've bought into all 10 of them. And so how do we say I'm walking down the street with this uh, cognitive knowledge of that there's infinite possibilities out there. How do I, or how does one loosen their relationship to what they perceive reality to be, whether it's with women or money or career? By developing the ability to change their reality on a consistent basis. And I don't mean something huge to start with. I mean, little things. Yeah. Start with something little, like where can you, I remember the first thing I started with, it was really funny because I was learning all this. And I said, well, what can I believe that I can shift? Because I, I really believed my life was fixed. I had no money. I had no girls. I had no anything. I was unhealthy. I said, well, I believe that people, I can, I can meditate on people offering me water, you know, today. And I'm not going to ask for water all day, but I'm going to see how much water I can get just by meditating on the idea. And I swear that day I must have got offered glasses or cups of water, bottles of water like five times. And I was shocked. And that was the first thing I noted. Oh my God, that, that really happened. And then my mind immediately goes to, well, they offered because of this, they offered because of that coincidence. And I'm like, but I'm not, I'm not seeing that. Yes, they may be off, but subconsciously I sent that pattern like a domino effect to create those realities, whether it happened because of a cause, a, a law of cause and effect on a subtle, subtle level that I couldn't see, or it happened just magically. It doesn't really matter. It still happened. And I still put that that pair that that dynamic into effect to create that reality. Uh, a good example of this is: uh, Did you did you see the? Do you remember the part about the random number generators? Yeah, 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 yeah. So we can influence. They show they would take these random number generators and they would ask people to meditate on these random number generators and try to influence the appearance of ones and zeros, well, one direction or the other, or and. Um, and they noticed that they could do it. They could influence it so that it started going a little bit more one direction or another, uh, depending on how they meditated or focused their consciousness, especially people that had really good consciousness, the ability to move. So even if that was, let's say that's happening at a 1% increase in another direction, like you've increased the, 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 the number generation of the ones 1% 1 more than the zeros, let's say that could have a massive effect in your, in your life and your ability to create your own reality, massive off the charts. That 1% crossing from uh, the Atlantic Ocean and you're off by one degree and you stay off one degree the whole way crossing is you're not even going to end up close to your destination. You're going to end up in a whole other place. And that, that can, that's, that's how reality shifts. That's why we say the 1% rule is so important. Matter of fact, it's not even 1%. If it's 1 100th, 1 1,000th of a percent over a lifetime compounded, you end up with a whole different life. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. It's stuff like this that fascinates me. Well, we also have that, that little ego voice which resists uh, how reality shifts. And yeah. like, remember we were, uh, we, when we went to Erwan and, uh, and I manifested a, a woman saying hi to me and having a conversation asking me for my phone number. For guys don't know, this is part of uh, an energetic embodiment manifesting practice where I, uh, Brian took us through this, uh, this meditation into feeling what you want to have happen as if it's already happening in your body. So you can really uh, take it in all, all the sights, the smells, so you can set your vibration to the frequency of someone else or something else that matches that. Mine was simply a woman says hi, waves to me and says hi. 
we have a nice conversation and uh, um, then she asked for my phone number. So that night it was really late and we went to get something to eat and I would go to the bathroom and a woman out of nowhere walks up to me and says, hi, now we have a nice conversation. And uh, then she asked for my phone number. This happened within an hour of me meditating on it. What's interesting, my point is, is that it took me almost walking back to you, you know, the 50 feet to find you, for my ego voice to not call this a coincidence and to blossom it into, whoa, here's an entirely new reality. Yeah. And it happens over and over again where we are, we, the little voice and says, this is a coincidence, this is a coincidence. How many coincidences do you have to have in your life to make you understand that, no, this is, this is a form of reality? Yeah, and, and, and because we can go back and try to find a way to explain away anything. The question is, this is, this is an interesting point you made, because when I look at people trying to explain things, they always want all this scientific data. Even if the scientific data, but, 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 but so I see two types of people. I see people that say anecdotal evidence doesn't matter. And I see people that say you got to, and you got to have scientific data. And I see other people that are like me that I'm like fine with anecdotal evidence. As long as the anecdotal evidence is consistent and played out over time. Um, so if I see that, that a teacher is getting a lot of success and the students are changing, I know there's something in the students, the teacher's doing because they're getting the, 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 the successes. Whereas the other person, I see this all the time, they'll say, but that's all anecdotal. We don't have scientific data proving that. Then they'll cite scientific papers that aren't getting the results they want, but scientifically it was proved out in an experiment. And then years later, they find out why that experiment was screwed up. Because a lot of these experiments that are technically scientific are just observational studies. The observer uh, on some level, the, 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 uh, the uh, scientist affected the experiment in some level because he really wanted to push, there was a certain funding behind it. I mean, there's so many things. What I'm interested in is results. And when I look at people like what you just said, that can create their own reality consistently and they can journal it down over and over and over again, I see that they can do it more and more and more. And they start influencing those infinite number of possibilities into form and the forms start to become, and, and the more you do it, the more you build the neural net in the brain that believes you can do it. The stronger the neural net gets, the better you can do it, the faster you can do it. And you start to get out of the programmed attractor fields or belief systems of society that tell you all of this is impossible. Because I believe the only thing that makes creating the reality you want impossible is the belief that it's impossible. And we plug into so many different societal belief systems that tell us how to believe and then we buy into all of them we buy into this scientific community and that and the religion Brian, you business. froze you froze up if you can hear me i'll uh, repeat the yeah. last 30 seconds whoops okay. yeah now, so go we, back you're on something so we, we when we have a bunch of beliefs controlling what we can create those beliefs are a product not just of what we think but everybody that we've plugged into the attractor field. So there's the scientific attractor fields and there's different scientific groups. There might be religious attractor fields. There might be the society, the family I grew up in telling me what's possible. There might be, and we plug into each like a plug and each one of those sets of belief systems we plug into. And the more we're plugged into, that's all memory in the past, the more we're, we're creating our future from it. And I believe that, that the only thing that stops you from creating your own reality, because those are all creating from the, the, the quantum field, the, 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 primor, the, the unified field theory that's bringing par, uh, waves into particles, those, those, all those attractor fields are bringing up the same experience over and over and over again. Are you, now I can't hear you, Doug. If you can hear me, I'm going to uh, vamp for four minutes while I get started again here. What's wrong? Uh, my, I, I'm going to fix my internet. So, um, okay. So, so leave the meeting and come back. Okay. Sounds good, buddy. So this is the, when I, so particles and waves are, are, are the key. So what happens is the beliefs move the waves to particle. And then we, we have this experience of life and then we want to validate the external experience of life. When in reality, the external, we want to validate, we look at what's out there and say, this is how life works. How often do you look in here, change this and see that change and realize this isn't how life works. And we keep doing that over and over and over again throughout life. And we're finding deeper and deeper um, 
Um, and I'm not an expert on quantum physics, but I am very good at understanding how thought creates reality because everything basically boils down to thought. A lot of uh, quantum physicists today believe that uh, the reality is just pure information. It's information in what we perceive as a physical form. But even physicality, it, quantum physics isn't real. Like everything is 99% empty space, right? Everything, if you, if you take these, deep, these powerful microscopes and you look at things at, at the deepest, uh, at, the, at, the, at, the, uh, at, the, at the deepest level, you're looking at the um, nucleus and, and you're looking at how everything down, and see this is stuff I'm not an expert on, but I've been watching it the last few days. And I'm gonna become very uh, versed in it because it helps me to explain scientifically what's going on. But you look at the nucleus, uh, the neuron, or what is it, the nucleus and the, I'm sure somebody on here's got it. I saw somebody writing some stuff, but basically you'll see that everything is basically at the deepest level is really not solid, 99% empty space. It's more like a holographic image. There's a really good book called The Holographic Universe that talks a lot about this, that the world is a giant hologram. And, um, and, and really things are more like waves of energy. And in this book, The Holographic Universe, which I love, they, they show a piece of holographic film and the holographic film is just waves, but if then they project light through it, it causes a 3D image to come up that looks really real. And, but, it, but if they take it away, you still see these, this film that looks like waves of energy. But what they're saying is that life is more like these waves of energy. We, and what happens is our eyeball translates those waves those waves of energy, just like on the film, but the waves of energy that are in the environment around us and turns it into a 3D image. And then we get this experience of a 3D image. Uh, and then we get the experience of solidness because I believe it was the atoms are pushing away from each other is, is what they were talking about. Is that how they described it? And what the belief is the atoms push away from each other, right? Yeah. And so, and there's this appearance of solidness because of that. But in reality, nothing is really solid. It's all an illusion to the point now where they think that there are, sci there are scientists literally that believe that we are in an assimilation, living in a simulation that's being, that's a this quantum computer in another universe that's creating a simulation here. And then that one's also a simulation and it goes on infinitely. So we have all these dimensions of possibilities too. And this is all science, this isn't metaphysics at this point. Um, and there's a lot of physicists that are starting to believe this pretty it's pretty crazy uh they even believe that that what we see with the eye is just uh, uh um uh was it tetrahedrons in, in pixelation they're they're, they're little pixelation like a, a pixelation on the screen is little dots that make up the image of sam on the screen right now or me on the screen yeah. well they believe the same thing's happening to us in a 3d form and it's and they're called plank uh i believe it was uh, if you take these tetrahedrons that have these plank sides and each plank is the maximum length that you can possibly have. It's the, it's the, or the, the, it's the tiniest particle that things exist, I guess is the way, but each one is a tetrahedron. So they're all in these little pyramid like shapes and they come together to make up 3D images and then they form and that's, that's what we see. And, right. and it's, it's pretty crazy, but that's all still just, it's just like a computer image or a 3D computer image popping up and create just like we would do with pixelation on a screen or in a 3D model. And then we look at it and we say, oh, Sam's real. But is he? Okay, well, he is, but not in the way we see him. <laughs> this, is, this is what I was uh, reading about, uh, the big lie, that the biggest lies told, say like Hitler told a big lie. Big lies are easier to believe than small lies because the energy, the size of the lie is so all encompassing that it bypasses that part of your brain that says this can't be true. <laughs> and that we do it to ourselves constantly. In fact, that's what, in fact, reality is the big lie. Yep, I agree with that. And, and we can convince ourselves of almost anything. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's pretty crazy. Uh, That's where a lot of, and this is where you have trouble with, I have trouble with things like, um, and I love them at the same time, is conspiracy theories. You know, we have all these conspiracy theories. The world's trying, the, 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 all the governments want to take us over right now, and they're using COVID-19. It was created in a lab to take over the whole world, you know. Maybe, maybe not, you know, but that's a, that's a great story, and it's easy to buy into a lot of drama around it, you know. Well, think of the stories that we all buy into. Um, I don't want to get into conspiracy theories around 9-11, uh, 
But if you scratch the surface of that, it goes deep. To, it goes deep. And, uh, and the big lie could have been, well, who knows what the truth is. But if you look at Building 7 and how Building 7 fell over without a plane hitting it, 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 it will spin your mind around. Well, you think about stuff like this, and I find the truth is somewhere usually in the middle. Yeah. It's, like, it's just like the middle way, the middle path. There's usually something in the middle. There's some really good, they also talk about the, because I've looked at that a lot, and Building 7 is fascinating to me. But they, let's take, for example, the Apollo moon landing. I think Joe Rogan was talking about this. And there's a picture of a guy floating in space, but they were able to show that this, and everybody thought the picture was real, but then somebody was able to show that, that picture was actually a shot of somebody in a warehouse made to look like he was in space. So then everybody jumps to the conclusion that we didn't go to space because all these pictures must be fake because this one was proved to be fake. And, and so then immediately people start running down that road and looking for more proof. But what you look for by focus, by what law of focus, law of attraction, you start to prove. But what if the truth is somewhere in the middle? What if that shot was really taken in a warehouse? What if they needed a shot of space for a publicity photo and somebody didn't have time to get the right shot, so they couldn't get the right shot, so they just took this one and doctored it up so it looked good and put it out there, not thinking anybody would think anything of it. But in reality, we did go to space too. I mean, that's how life really works. And so all these possibilities exist. And that's when I began to ask myself, does it really matter? Does it really matter? What matters? is that I create the best reality for me possible using these principles and for everybody else, rather than trying to, because the more I focus on the idea that everybody's lying to me, I create more pain and suffering in the world. So. Uh, okay, so this might be proof of my insanity, but I was at a wedding last summer, up in the, way up in the Rocky Mountains, beautiful friend of mine's daughter was getting married, high mountain plains surrounded by peaks outside of Rocky Mountain National Park. And the wind started to pick up and it was getting like those intense uh, Rocky Mountain rainstorms that came in. Hundred people sitting outside. It was, uh, and everybody was beginning to freak out because they hadn't started coming down the aisle yet. So I'm watching all these people freak out. And I thought, well, this isn't fun. This would be a drag if this wedding was ruined. What if I made up my own reality where it doesn't rain at all? What if I just call in that when it does rain, it'll come right at the end. So I just sat and amongst all the chaos, I just sat there and just felt how beautiful the wedding would be and how, how much I love these people. And I just sent love out and they came down the aisle and <laughs> not only did it not rain, but at the very end, right when they kissed, it started to rain. The first drop of rain happened when they kissed and a giant clap of thunder and lightning hit way down the valley and just lit up the sky behind them. That's beautiful. I love that story. That's perfect. So, can I change reality? Well, I changed my, among the infinite realities that I could have chosen, I chose the one that was going to make me the happiest. Well, now let's, let's play this within the quantum physics again or quantum mechanics. If there is no past and future in quantum mechanics, everything's happened already or is happening at once or, or everything exists at once, the future and the past, and that we're actually creating our present from our future and past. In other words, we're referencing the future to create the present just as much as we're referencing the past. That's what they say. Mm -hmm. So our future self is telling our current self how to behave. Um, who knows that if everybody didn't work together on a consciousness level to make that happen, you see what I mean? By knowing what the future was going to be. So did you really change reality or did you just adjust yourself through knowing the future to reality based on quantum physics? Another way to look at it is, yeah. is um, based on quantum physics is you can't have this crazy reality, anything that we're experiencing without consciousness. Consciousness is the key factor. Can anything around you exist without your consciousness? Matter of fact, you don't even know for re in reality if anybody else's consciousness is really real. Or if it's just, a, you know, you know your consciousness, but you can't look out, I can't look out your eyes. I can't look out um, uh, out of somebody else's eyes. I can get the feeling, I can go to one, a sense that of oneness that I am you, if I go deep enough in meditation, that sense I get the feeling I'm looking out your eyes, but then I'm looking out my own eyes again. So if that's the case, can any of this reality you're experiencing right now, sitting in front of your computer screen at home, does any of it exist if your consciousness isn't there? Now, can you picture 
all of this changing, this reality changing, or not even being there, being an empty space and still having your consciousness. Well, I can't. I can picture myself still being there with consciousness, but I can't picture reality existing without my consciousness. So my consciousness is the key element in this reality existing and having an experience of it. So that's the one key element. If I'm there, does it exist? So in that, in that sense, are you actually creating every experience you have more than you realize, even the experience of other people, and to what degree? At the you know, very least, it makes life much more interesting. Yeah. So imagine you are creating moment to moment to moment amongst infinite possibilities. Yeah. I mean, true. if, uh, if uh, I trip on the side on a crack on the sidewalk, well, I could get mad at the sidewalk or do that embarrassed look at the sidewalk and make sure everybody knows that it wasn't me who tripped myself, it was the sidewalk. Or I could say this has meaning. Yeah. And to live in the mystery of what does that little meaning, what is that little meaning? Yeah, I'm rushing too much in life and pushing, you know, or something, you know, who knows? Yeah, right. Because uh, I believe everything has meaning. Everything is teaching us all the time yeah. how to be more conscious. That's where life gets interesting. And that's the key to stop being a victim to things rather than you are, did I actually create uh, me tripping on the sidewalk? Well, mm -hmm. Life gets interesting if I do. I have to stop blaming myself for the bad things that happen. This is where. Uh, the law of attraction starts getting a little wonky, right? Am I choosing all the bad things? Am I manifesting all that? Well, is there even a bad thing? Also, remember that, that, that again, that you can't, you can't have meaning without comparison. We have to get to create meaning. We have need law of relativity. We need to compare something to something else for it to have meaning. And, and so if there, if we take away all comparison, everything just is. If there's no ability to go in the future and the past and compare this experience to something else, then therefore it's just an experience and it has no meaning. It's neither good nor bad. Yeah. Um, we, we have to define what good and bad is. But what if everything at the highest level was for your good? Even the worst experience was to wake you up more and to give you a greater experience of consciousness. What if there is no real death? Because uh, really high spiritual people will say death is actually birth into another dimension a higher dimension, um, which I believe too. I believe there's many dimensions. That's what we were talking about earlier. And we we're talking about a, the eighth dimension. That stuff does exist in science now. At least they're, they're working, they're, all, they're getting, it's, a, it's a becoming a highly accepted th theory. So what if this idea that we just transmission from, trans, that like, like being born, we're trans, transfer, we're moving from one dimension, the, the non-physical into the womb, from the womb into the phys this, this physical dimension. So there's, we're moving from space to space, just like moving from a room to room. We're 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 we're, we're transferring from one space to another, uh, or the you that existed 20 years ago doesn't exist today. That that person has changed every cell in the human body and is a whole new being. So we're constantly going through this transition. It never stops. And since energy can never go out of uh, can never cease to exist, it's just changing form. So in reality, we're just expanding consciousness. You know, we're growing and changing, and that's that's the whole purpose of life. So there is no real good or bad. We get the bad one side of the polarity because when one side of the polarity rises up and causes enough, uh, uh, let's say, pain in that example, because we're in resistance to it, it causes the other side to rise up too and causes a massive transformation of consciousness and raises our consciousness again to a new level and a new level till eventually we stop seeing the bad as bad and we start seeing it as good for our growth, which then takes us to the next level of, of reality. This actually happened in a small way. Several months ago, I went to a, a Berkeley, con, one of those new age, we're going to, or connection, and a connection event where we're going to connect. So I went in there and I hated the whole thing. I hated the energy of the room. And so even though I was paid $30, I left, but I was fucking annoyed. Uh, Part of it was my annoyance, like maybe I'm not conscious enough to really drop into this deep level, whatever, it was a shit show inside of me. Because of that, on the way back, I called a girl who I'd just only been on one date with. Why did I call her? I just complain. You know, I never, for some reason I called her. We had a great talk, told me about this movie Heal on Netflix, about what we're talking about in terms of your physical health. 
So I went home and I watched it twice. I was so enamored with it. I sent the link to two or three people I knew who could really use this perspective. And that night I'm sitting in bed going, how did I get here? I was feeling really good. I connected, I learned something, I was sending it to friends and I went back in time. <laughs> oh yeah, I did this because I called her and she told me and then I called her because I was annoyed. Why was I annoyed? Because I went to a stupid Berkeley connection event, which means the connection event had ultimate meaning. Yeah. My annoyance with the connection event had meaning. Yeah, very much so. Deep meaning. And, you know, there's, um, if you take that to the extreme level, you could look at like um, Man's Search for Meaning, you know, uh, that book, Man's Search for Meaning by, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, you know what I'm talking about, right? No, I can't. I don't remember. I've got it right here. Um, I was actually just reading it. So um, somebody posted. Somebody's got it. Somebody posted it in the uh, chat. Um, let's go down here. Wow, the chat got long. I have to go through this. Uh, Victor Frankel. Yeah. So Victor Frankel uh, yep. went through uh, what is about three years or so in the concentration camps in. Uh, and uh, he came out the other side and wrote this amazing book, Man's Search for Meaning. That book was life transforming for me. And it was obviously that experience was life transforming for him, which then went out and had the ripple effect of being life transforming for so many other people throughout the world. And, um, and it was a powerful, powerful experience. Uh, ultimately, in the end, it really helped to change his consciousness on a fundamental level and understanding that man is really on a deep level, um, and I would agree with him, we are searching for meaning more than we are searching for, like Freud would say, what, sex and, and that primary urge for sex, but I think we have a, a greater urge to have our life of meaning than even sex. Um, and that's powerful when you, when you think about it. So, and that's pain. You know, he went through three years of almost on a daily basis he was facing death there was so much surrender in that too i mean he was talking about reaching the point where he was okay with it you know if i die today i die today but i'm gonna keep going forward anyways and i'm gonna keep choosing the next the next thing you know and that was that's the beautiful thing about what and, the, and when i read that there was such a deep surrender in me because i was experiencing um, some apathy and that apathy just lifted there was this like the moment is what the moment is. And in that, there is so much beauty, even if it's heavy. And then that set me free on so many levels in that moment. It's really powerful. Yeah, and even the search for meaning, even the search itself is something to be surrendered to because yeah. search for meaning is a, is a bottomless uh, pit. Yeah. Yeah, you can't find an answer while you're searching anyways. Yeah. Maybe the elemental desire is for connectedness or oneness as we've talked about. Right, I heard an interesting thing that uh, perspective that from the Big Bang, whether that happened or not, I, I'm not a physicist, I have no idea. But that means from that moment that the universe was created and everything, every piece of matter and wave and particle was created from that one moment, which means you and I and the 98 guys in this call all are from the same place, share the same energy that emanated billions and billions of years ago yeah it's 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 pretty much a mind fuck um <laughs> you know, and uh the more you look at it the crazier it gets and that's why i'm really fascinated with this whole uh 3d or 8d lattice because it's just you really begin to realize that all those particles and 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 you know uh, all that that stuff you can't see with the human eye and that 8D lattice, it accounts for it all and actually begins to integrate it into the theory of relativity and starts to bring it into the physical world, how they, how they play off of each other. Um, you know, the world we can't see is the world of possibilities. It's the world of malleability. And the world we see is the world of thought. And that we take all that non, that ability to not see, that all that stuff we can't see and we bring it into forms with our thought. And that's the game we're playing. It's, it's a video game. You know, um, you know, I saw, uh, uh, I sent you the name of that physicist, uh, I don't know if you checked him out, but he said, science fiction is, m is manifesting the future from the imagination of the present. And he, and I looked up like Dick Tracy watch now, I don't know if 
and how much old people are here, but Dick Tracy, when in 19, the 1940s, the, uh, the creator of Dick Tracy comic books uh, created a thing called the, the Dick Tracy Watch. And it had a video screen on it and it had uh, information on it. And it was initially by the publisher of the cartoon said, I love the cartoon, but take out that stupid watch. That just feels like, a, it feels like a cheat. Oh, you mean you can just solve any problem just by looking at your watch? So he, it wasn't in the publisher's reality. And he finally found a man who could actually was, was trying to invent things like that. So he realized, oh, this is actually possible. And he put it back in the, in the cartoon. Would the iPhone or the Apple Watch exist without that? I'm going to say no, because someone had to dream it up. That means every piece of science fiction is, will become real because we imagine it to be real. Well, the potentiality for it to be real is there if we keep focusing on it and, and, and create a fixed um, neural net around it or a fixed retractor field for it. So everything exists in time and space. So the, here's the, the basic idea is that everything that can exist already exists in somewhere in space, in time and space. The idea for it, the, the energy for it. Uh, otherwise, we wouldn't be able to find it to, to bring it into reality. We wouldn't be able to think it up if it didn't exist somewhere in time and space. The question is, is, is can, we, can we put enough attractor field energy around it to bring it into reality? For example, flight by the Wright, Wright brothers. The Wright brothers, you know, they, the bulk of the world, the, tra the bulk of attractor fields at that time said, Flight was impossible. German scientists said flight was impossible. It can't be done. But these guys were determined to it with bicycle cars. They unplugged. They got their passion, their burning desire became greater than the bulk of the world's attractor field saying this was impossible. And they built that energy up. They unplugged from all that energy, said, we're going to do it anyways. We're willing to risk their lives well, all their spare time, put their, all their energy, their love, their passion, their emotion. They built up their own attractor field, probably with a certain amount of people around them and friends that started to buy into it. That energy started to build. Then the answers started to, the answers already existed. The way to fly already existed in the world, in, in consciousness. Mm -hmm. Now, all we had to do was bring it into physical, from the non-physical, the, the unified field theory, up into the physical consciousness. And then until we, and, and keep experimenting, adjusting, a little bit more, a little bit more, they're overcorrecting this way, undercorrecting that way, till we found that sweet spot where it actually exists. And then we began, and then we flew. Now, did the ability to fly happen before the Wright brothers ever put the bicycle parts together? Well, yeah, it had to have. Otherwise, they couldn't have put the bicycle parts together to create flight. So the ability to fly was already there. Back in the 1600s, the ability to get the moon was there. We had all the, we had all the raw materials. The science existed. We just hadn't figured it out yet. Mm -hmm. The cell phone, the, I, the ability to create the, 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 the iPhone existed in, in 1000 BC. We just didn't know how to put it all together. We didn't have the consciousness high enough yet to bring the move that iPhone into consciousness. But through people dreaming about, through possibilities, playing with all these possibilities for generations and generations, it eventually comes out of the, the unified field or the zero point field into the physical reality because there was a, an, enough energy built around the idea. The same thing with the Empire State Building coming into being. Yeah. And ultimately, you know, that's, that's, the, that's how it all works. So the first step is knowing that the possibility exists. Oh yeah, if you can dream it up and you have a passion, a God-given burning desire, like in your heart, it has to be in your heart, this, this is energy. It's like, it's not just a fantasy up here, you can feel it here. Then there's a way to achieve it. Maybe you'll, help move, maybe like Elon Musk to move it forward, the ability to get to Mars tenfold for the next guy. Maybe you have to get to Mars. It depends on how alignment and how much he believes. But we will eventually get to Mars. I have I'm wholeheartedly believing in that. There's too much energy, attractor fields being built around this idea that we are going to get to Mars. And it's getting built more and more every day. And uh, the naysayers, are, you know, there's tons of naysayers, but we will, you know, just like everything else that they said was impossible, it will eventually seem obvious. I mean, at one point we thought we couldn't run a four minute mile without hurting the body severely, right? Yeah. And, and then we did it, Roger Bannister did it. So. You remember the um, part of the movie where he talks about how um, the power of positive thought and how that's just a smear of of uh, all the stuff that's happening underneath. And that if we, is it, he asked the question, is it possible for us to walk on water? Of course it is. 
but you have to believe it with every fiber and cell and particle and wave in your body. And once yeah. you do, you'll be walking on water. Yeah, so let's, let's, let's take that again a little deeper. So that's, you're 100% right. How many beliefs would you have to unplug from yes. societal beliefs before you can believe enough to be able to do that? How many, how many beliefs and people and energies around you are bombarding your consciousness and telling you that is impossible? And then you have to unplug from all of that before you can do it. So what do we think? And you think that your 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 goal is to walk on water, but as you let go of beliefs, then you find you can do other things that you didn't imagine were even no. possible. Oh yeah, long before the, before he'll walk on water with consciousness, what'll happen? There'll be intermediary steps, and these are the things you're talking about, yeah. and uh, these deeper realizations about life, about you, about meaning on the way down to that journey. And even the ability to um, maybe you'll invent some special shoes that help you to walk on water. And then it'll be like, see, he's still not walking on water. He's using special shoes that he invented. He is walking on water. Whether he, It's like the guy, Jetman, who's figured out how to fly. Like super, We're saying you can't fly like Superman. That's impossible. So this guy creates these little wings with these little jet packs and this little helmet with oxygen, goes out there, jumps out of a plane and flies like Superman. It's just like a little bullet through the air. Look him up. He's called Jetman. He's got a friend. They do it together. They fly next to jets in the air. They're amazing. He's literally flying like Superman. Yes, he has the assist of a jetpack and oxygen, so it all makes sense to our consciousness, and we can all buy into this reality. And probably before he did it, everybody was told him he was going to kill himself. He didn't. Um, and But with time, we'll refine that and refine that and refine that until who knows what will happen as consciousness grows with that ability. Well, you think about the guys who come to a fearless workshop, what 90% of them want to be better with women. They have a goal with women. They come to the workshops, whether it's the experience or something else, and they have this goal out there, but then, they're, then their goal is what gets them in the door, but what they discover about themselves to get to that goal starts to even shift what they imagine that goal to be, Yeah, which is what it's all about. Our marketing is, is, is interesting because that, that very topic is so part of our marketing is we, we really market to becoming a whole man, a man that's really powerful, that believes in himself, that thinks he's worthy versus how to get the girl. We don't necessarily market how to get the girl, how to get a date. We market to how to be the best version of yourself you can be because those are the guys we want. And, and, and those are the guys that realize at a deep level, it's not the girl they want. It's, it's, the girl comes when I love myself and what I really want is to feel that I'm just as valuable as that hot girl that I perceive as better than me, that I'm just as important as she is, that I have just as much value in the world. And when you get that, you become a magnet versus you chasing, trying to get something and watching it run away, like chasing a dog, you become a magnet and what you want starts to pull towards you. And that's, you, you shift the polarity on that and that energy, which again, um, Think of uh, our, our client, the dentist, who uh, came uh, for girls, and he had completely changed his whole, did the first thing that happened was his entire dental practice just blew up and became successful. Yep, I remember. <laughs> and he he's just keeps coming back and changing more. I can't tell you how many students that come in here for the live work, and they start, and they start making more money, they become more successful, they become healthier all these other things that are a big part of them being great with women or men as in my, I saw my sister Becky's on the, on the call and um, uh, uh, everything is possible. And I, well, you know, how many of you guys, I want to, you know, you guys out there, how many of you guys actually do a study of the impossible becoming possible? This is something I've literally done. I've gone out there and I've said, okay, does this unified field that brings the uh, unmanifested and the manifested exist? What the, the, is it that seems impossible that has become possible? First off, that would be cell phones, escalators, elevators, planes. This idea of a plane is absolutely freaking ridiculous. If you lived 200 years ago and you saw a plane, you'd lose your mind. Yeah. You, could, you could go insane. Uh, you know, naval aircraft carriers. Uh, this if idea. You could even see the plane when it was in front of you. That's the, that's the, yeah. You you swear it was a bird because the the distance and the optical illusion. Yeah. You, you, you wouldn't be able to understand what that thing is up there. So um, things, like, things like this. But what about today? What do we got today that's starting to happen that is already blows people's minds? And there's a little TV show called Stanley Superhuman. And it's a great 
TV show to watch for this. And it's just a doc, a little half hour documentary series, series on people doing the impossible or doing what seems like it should be impossible or really hard to do. And um, such a fascinating show. That's where they, I first saw um, um, the man who runs forever. You know, his body doesn't wear out running. He ran 50 marathons, 50 days in a row. He doesn't, his body's fine. He doesn't, he's, he, wear, you know, he can run all day. And, and he, they, they did a study on him. The scientists hooked up some uh, equipment to him to see how his body operates. And they realized his body was eating lactic acid for fuel, which is what tears down the muscles. And, um, and so he was literally doing the impossible. And what the scientists said was that he's got, uh, he, he is the precursor to probably a future human ability that more humans will get. He's just the first to get it. Yeah. And then you got the Iron Cowboy who did 50 triathlons, 50 days in a row. And you got Wim, Wim Hof, somebody just wrote that here. He's doing the impossible. Um, and, uh, you know, he's out there doing what people would think is impossible, but it's not. Uh, you had the guy who uh, could see in the dark and he couldn't explain how he could do it. He was on the show. They would blindfold him and put him in a pitch black room and they would put a vases at different heights in the room and they give him a baseball bat. So they had, they had, they had, I think it was infrared cameras. They had him in a pitch black room. They had him blindfolded and they would tell him go over to the blue vase. So he didn't know where the blue vase was in the room and he didn't know what height it was. And he'd walk right over and hit it. They go hit the red vase and he'd go hit that one. And he kept doing this and they said, how do you do this? And he goes, I don't know, <laughs> but he has this ability. Or how about the kids that use sonar just to see? They're blind also and they, they ride their bicycles. And they go around objects, you know. There is so much going on in the unseen world. The brain is processing it. According to uh, the neuroscientist um, Dispenza, the brain is processing a billions of data, a bit, bits of data per second. And we're not seeing, we're just seeing a tiny fraction of it. And if you could tap into the rest of that, oh my God. So... I get really excited when I talk about it. Yeah, yeah. Should we take uh, should we take uh, yeah. some questions? We're at the hour mark here. I think we need to. We need it. We can talk all day about this. I want to get deeper. I want to get deeper into the quantum physics of it all, though. I really want to start. I'm really good with new thought and natural law and understanding. And I've created a lot with my reality, and I keep creating more. And I teach other people to do it. So the net, my new goal is kind of to go deeper and deeper into the quantum physics of it all, and quantum mechanics, and the. Um, uh, this type of stuff and start to bring you the, that the science from that perspective. So it's not just because I don't want it to all be about like for people that don't really buy into the metaphysical pr perspective, I want people to understand the scientific and see both sides that we can play on both sides and we can see that it's all starting to come together a little bit at a time. We're getting more and more understanding of how you create your own reality. And I also want everybody to understand in the beginning, it seems like you can't create your own reality. And that's largely because of all of the belief systems you're plugged into. If you're plugged into a ton of belief systems that are holding you back, that are, that are limiting what you believe is possible, fixed beliefs and beliefs that this is impossible and that's impossible. And you've been raised like, like, like a fish in water and all of that, you're gonna have to unplug from the bulk of that to start really creating a reality. It doesn't mean you're not creating your own reality. You are, but it's fixed right now. It's fixed based on the programming. And so when you start to make that programming malleable and not so fixed, what we call them, uh, fluid beliefs instead of fixed beliefs, then you start adjusting to the moment and start saying, wait a minute, I am creating all this. And, start, and it, it takes time to learn. It's like learning to surf. You know, if I throw you out in the waves the first day with a surfboard and you've never even swam in your life, it's going to be hell out there. You're going to get yourself beat up in those waves and you're going to have to learn to swim. You're going to have to learn to float. You're going to have to learn to, and it's where, and, and I tell you, you could stand on that board on the face of that wave and write it like, like, and, and, and write it and fly down the front, and have a blast doing it. You're going to tell me I'm crazy because you've never seen that before. You've never experienced that but with time. That is reality. And that's what you will be doing. If you want to keep going. When our brain can we see what um, our brain has seen before or experienced before. That's why in the movie there that it's uh, they talked about on the Cook Islands when the natives saw or when the ships uh, uh, came over, uh, you know, Captain Cook came over to the islands. The, the myth is that they couldn't see the clipper ships. Yeah, I've heard that one too. Whether it's true or not, it's, I, I believe it absolutely could be true because for totally. 2,000 years, those people only saw the horizon. So they couldn't not see the horizon even though there was a giant clipper ship on it. 
Oh, the concept of a ship that big would be insane to the mind. The mind would have to, to somehow make sense of that. And it might take a few days or a while. Yeah. And then yeah. I heard the other thing that they confused a lot of, uh, I, I believe this was, and I don't know if this is true, but I believe it was uh, when, we, when uh, Spain landed in, uh, in, in Mexico, the area that would be Mexico or over in that area, um, that they were on horseback when they first saw them and they didn't know what they were. They, they couldn't fathom the horseback thing. And so there was a sense of, is it, they thought it was one creature, you know, and they, it took them well, a Why bit. is that man floating five feet off the air? <laughs> yeah, something well, we like We do that. it to ourselves constantly. Mm -hmm. We do it to we, ourselves constantly in, small, in not so small ways. Oh yeah, yeah. And then we, we have to go into this. And a teacher of mine once said, Carl, was one of my great teachers. He said, uh, he said, if I could get up right now, walk through that wall, change my vibration to match the wall so I could walk right through it, what do you think would happen? <laughs> and I said, I don't know, I think it was pretty cool. <laughs> you know, I'd want to learn how to do it. And he goes, no, he goes, if your consciousness isn't at the point where it's ready to see it, then you will, if I raise my vibration level that I can do something like that, your consciousness will appear. You pr you'd probably go insane trying to, because it would, the vibration difference would be so huge. And then I thought about it more. I'd say, I'd either go insane or I'd come up with an excuse for why that didn't happen or why it was fake. You know, but so my brain would resolve it somehow until eventually it could happen. Um, so I think there's a lot of things that I've thought about this too. Is there, are there people that are doing things that are way beyond what society believes is possible? But because society as a whole can't accept it, we keep writing it off and won't even look at it, you know. And I'd want I'd want the guys listening to start questioning everything that they perceive as real in their lives, at least playing with the idea of it. Then things start getting a little bit more flexible and less fit. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's I had to do a lot of what I just did because I was so fixed in my consciousness to be able to break up the deep embedded stories to give me more power in the world. Yeah. I had so many stories telling me what was impossible. So by looking at the impossible all the time and, and just noting it and, and dreaming in it and seeing it done, I started to say, well, what isn't impossible? You know, what can I do? I just look, it's endless. And you start to get excited by this idea that maybe everything we know about how things work is actually very limiting and wrong. Yeah. And if uh, you take that same sense of curiosity in the world, then the entire world becomes your experiment. Oh, it is. What if I talked to that, what would happen inside of me if I talked to that six foot one model standing there in a bikini? Wonder what would happen if you can approach with that sort of sense of the observer, and then you get feedback about yourself, you get feedback about reality, and then things start to shift a little bit by little bit. Or well, what about developing the belief as a guy that just wanted to meet women that women just come up and hit on you all the time? Yeah. You don't even approach them. They hit on you. I, I know that uh, Brent Smith talked about this. That's the belief he developed and it started happening. He said at first it got worse. It didn't work at all because that was the stories coming up. And then he said, but then after I got through those stories, it actually started happening. And that became his reality. Well, this week I'm going to uh, get women to knock on my door because hmm. I just come flocking to my place. <laughs> and Chad said he did that. He said he wanted... He said he released on the idea. And I don't know if he's bullshitting me or not, but he released on the idea and meditated. He mainly released on the idea that a Playboy model or uh, something like that, like a, a, a it could be Playboy or, or a model. I think it was just a model. It might have been a Playboy model. Uh, would come to, would come to his door and come meet him. And so he said he, he released on this for months and months and months. And he said one day he got a knock on the door. And he opened the door and there was this beautiful woman standing there and he started talking to her and she just moved in down the street and she, and she was out of something in her kitchen and asked him if, if, if he could help her out and she needed something. I don't remember what it was. And, and then it turned out, yeah, she was a Playboy model. And, <laughs> and he was like mind blown at that point, you know? So I sometimes, you know, I ask myself, is he bullshit me on that one? But anything's possible. Anything's possible. Uh, I don't have all the questions cause I had to sign up and some sign back in. So, uh, Okay, I've, I got them right here. So let's, let's, uh, okay, uh, I'm going to go with the guy's question. He, he posted really quick when we first started at 11. So I try to study during the COVID-19 isolation period and I keep losing focus no matter how hard I try. 
I just don't make real progress. What should I do? Uh, you got to develop your focus. That's simple. Now, that's why I want to answer. It's a super simple, quick, easy answer. Just your ability, the average person, according to Joe Dispenza, only folk can hold focus about six to 10 seconds. So if your focus is constantly changing, then, uh, then whatever you're bringing up from that quantum field is constantly changing too. And so there's constant contradictions going on. And those contradictions don't allow you to manifest anything or create anything you want. So the ability to focus becomes your most important skill set. And what's stopping you from focusing is all your old beliefs coming up, like bubbling to the surface and distracting you. I don't want to see this. I don't want to think about that. I don't want to... So uh, one of the things I used to do to develop an ability to focus, I talked about it earlier this week, and then I'll have Sam give his, is I would meditate on candles. I would sit there and 10 minutes at a time, can I hold my focus on this candle for 10 minutes? And I wouldn't, ultimately my mind will wander, you come back, my will wander, come back, until eventually you can almost just stay with that candle, not letting your focus wander for 10 minutes straight. At first, it, for people that mind the wander a lot, you're, you'll, it'll be painful, you'll be uncomfortable, eventually it becomes blissful. Um, and you start to develop this real ability to sit and hold an idea in your frontal lobe. You want to develop the ability to hold the idea in your frontal lobe because that's where the magic happens. When you activate that frontal lobe, uh, that's the part of you that sees and experiences and activates possibilities and brings them into reality. So, so go for it. What were you going to say? Anything into that? No, I'm good. Let's keep going. Okay. I have a lot of things that are uh, <laughs> <laughs> <us> on topic. <laughs> Uh, I'm in lockdown at the moment is releasing the only thing I can do to get better with women right now. Well, there's, this goes back to what we were talking about earlier is what's the gift in anything. And this gift is, uh, is the opportunity to work on an internal world without being impacted with how we think the external world is going to react to what's happening inside. So is there anything you can do? There's, <laughs> there's limitless things you can do. It's some external and internal. External and internal. I mean, what do my, because this is all about shifting your internal world. Your, how you want the external world to be, it all starts inside of you. So just because there are no girls to talk to right now, doesn't mean you can't learn how to teach your body how to talk to girls. So yep. we've been, we practice energetic embodiment. I, uh, I, I, I set this out to, to my guys is that what can you sit at home and feel in your imagination as you take it from your, this, this movie in front of you and drop it into your body, what a beautiful connected interaction would feel like. And if you do that, daily and you can extend it into a date you can extend it into sex you can just just no i just want to have a cup of coffee what's it like to have a woman receive you what's it like receiving the interest of a woman you do that every day for the next three weeks or however long this is going to last you're not going to hit you're not going to open your door and have reality hit you in the face like a like a, a wet mitt you're going to be in that your body and your internal world will be in that flow already that's perfect. And that doing internal imagination work is so, so powerful. It can actually be more powerful than physically going and doing something. So that's, that's one way. Um, I'll add to that, that uh, I don't know where you live, but let's say you got a balcony. Can you stand out on your balcony and wave the girls? Can you sing the girls? Can you dance out on your balcony, let people see you and work on your, your fear of being embarrassed or fear of being seen? Uh, can you get on Tinder and just match with as many girls as possible and practice flirting? Because they're Tinder going nuts right now. Everybody's bored. And if you go on Tinder, it's match, match, match. It, and you can work out your profile and your insecurities and your indifference to outcome or your freedom from outcome and practicing random crazy shit and practicing being more bold and using all the same principles of tension and vulnerability and tender and treat each one as if she doesn't text me back. At least I learned something. Uh, you can use other dating sites too. Um, you can, um, um, uh, somebody wrote here, he, he does it all through Facebook. He just gets on Facebook, finds girls he likes, flirts with them and gets them to talk to him. Um, so flirting online right now is it, and then you can get people on zoom or Skype and you can have long conversations and stuff like that. So, so all of that. It's and also a good opportunity as we've been talking about is this idea of building self trust in yourself. Can you make a commitment for a week to do one thing each day to start building self trust in yourself? Mine recently is I'm uncomfortable in front of a video camera. Well, every day, in spite of how hard it has been early on, is to speak to a camera every day. 
and now it's getting lighter and lighter. And what I've really learned is that if I say I'm going to do something, I do it. And then I yeah. do it over and over and over again. It becomes less and less, there's less and less resistance. Actually, yesterday, I just thought, I'm not even going to plan anything. I'm just going to talk. And it was a really good one. Yep. That's really good. I, I, I'm doing the same stuff. I've, I've got a, a, a weekly practice. I'm following through with it every day because that's self-trust. I make it easy enough that I can follow through, but hard enough that I grow. Uh, one of the things I'm doing right now is every day I'm doing an Instagram video and I've been doing one on the business site and one on the personal site and I'm watching tons of Instagrammers and learn how to do it. I don't know. I'm making it up, but I love it. I'm having a great time doing it. If you guys got ideas for Instagram content, feel free to shoot it to me stuff you want to seek, whether it's my personal or the business. Um, but that one right there to me is, is huge. And then, um, and, uh, cause I've been avoiding it for so long and I realized I was damaging my self-esteem by my not following through on the, what I was saying and not trusting myself. So now it's become a major part of my life. Um, not post, mostly um, stories. I've been doing lots of stories. I need to get to post now. Um, and I'm going to, just to make myself vulnerable and in front of everybody, I'm going to post my little new uh, YouTube channel with my six videos on it. I want to see you post some of those uh, ukulele videos. Oh, yeah, my ukulele. <laughs> oh, yeah, I can do that. You play the ukulele like nobody I've ever heard. Everybody plays all these light, fluffy songs, and you play these deep, soulful. You turn it into like this, this soul instrument. You know, like yeah. I look for people that play it like you, and I can't find them. You're the only one that does that. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, you 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 give a whole new meaning to the, to ukulele. Um, how to influence our feelings, feelings to achieve success with women? That's a very generic question. Uh, learn to release. It's probably the easiest thing you do. Read the book Letting Go by David Hawkins. Um, unless Sam wants to say something, because we got a lot of questions. So I'll keep this going. That's a basic question that we get all the time. So, uh, okay, Daniel. Hey, Daniel. What's up, buddy? Hi, Brian and Sam. Are you, you are simply the best out there. Awesome. Thank you. You are too. Uh, I have a question. When you are releasing, it means you are always uh, releasing a part of your old self, old beliefs. Remember, the, the old self, self is a concept, right? And we want to break up that self because don't, identify, don't, don't think your ego is you. Your ego is a program that you project consciousness through. So I'm just kind of playing with that a little bit. Can you potentially become a new version of yourself? You can become any version you want to create. You can build the flexible, fluid ego that adjusts to the moment. You need some level of personality function in the world because if you meditate at a deep, deep level, you can just go into bliss states and have no personality and just sit there. Um, can you potentially become a new version of yourself by only focusing on your new self every day without any releasing of old self? Uh, I, I will say inadvertently you will release and cause by doing that causing a new self to be born uh, if you do it well and you, what do you want to say no I'm good I'm checking out I'm, I'm not listening right now I'm, I'm checking yeah. one thing so you really good ahead. imagination feeling focus work and you keep picturing that new self over and over and over and over again uh, through rather through your dreams whether unconsciously consciously you will be releasing the old self and building the new self if you do a good job but some people go into so much resistance that they need the releasing helps them to speed it up drastically read the book a um, uh, simple little book it's actually online on YouTube it's like a 45 minute audio it's called um, um, it's a Neville Goddard uh, feeling is the secret Feeling is the secret by Neville Goddard, and that's he does exactly that. He 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 imagines not doing the thing, but after he's done the thing, and he's celebrating, relaxing. What would he be doing after he completed? And he does it every day, right before sleep, to take it into his subconscious mind. And then while he's asleep, the subconscious mind does the releasing. Um, I'll read the next one. Did, did you have something you wanted to say, Sam, or anything you want to come in here? No, let's keep going. Okay, Daniel or David, excuse me. What are good resources to learn more about quantum physics? Um, ah, I'm still figuring all that out. There's some good people in here. There's some people I actually think that understand quantum physics in the chat probably better than we do because they actually study it more. I study more new thought and natural law, which quantum physics breaks down to ultimately. It's, it's the same thing, but from a different set of teachings. So uh, I watched what the belief, which is from 2004, but there's tons of uh, videos and books out there. What, what's the book you're reading? Someone just mentioned in the chat it's called the Tao of Physics. Yeah, and uh, it's mostly about Eastern philosophy and and how these are 
of the two belief systems are coming together and are in confluence now. Um, so, and then have you ever heard of, uh, any of you guys out there ever heard of um, uh, the Dancing Wooly Masters by uh, Gary Zukoff? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> I haven't read that. I want to read that. that. That's an old book too, but it's supposed to be pretty amazing from what I understand. I don't know if it's outdated or not. Maybe it's been updated. Uh, Tom Campbell, somebody's talking about, has the clearest perspective on connection between reality and quantum physics and consciousness I've seen. And that's from Max. Uh, Dr. Uh, Joe Dispenza, uh, he's more of a neuroscientist, but he talks a lot about quantum physics, but he talks about the neurology, the brain, the neural net a lot, and how we focus and create a reality that way. Well, Joe gets well, great yeah. sometimes for people. Hmm? This one's called Mother Earth Spirituality. A beautiful book on Native American uh, paths to healing ourselves in the world, and and I have a very strong connection to this type of spirituality, which is really just based on are. Mother Earth, Father Sky, and the Great right. Mystery. Well, I think it's a great book. I love all the little pictures on there and stuff. I, that would yeah. pull in a second. Yeah, yeah, it's beautiful. So, yeah. Good, but. one more of that too. Um, Okay, um, Liam. Hey guys, thank you for helping me and so many others see ourselves. My question is, could you demonstrate a quick releasing or lust or demonstrate a quick release on lust or neediness? I noticed when I was about to go on Instagram live last night, it brought up a wave of those feelings and in today, uh, and in, and today towards talking to women. Um, well, it's just a simple question, really. Do you, do you want to? Uh, do you do you do you want to? Uh, would you rather want women or would you rather have women? I mean, that's the simple question. Would you rather need women or would you rather have women? Would you rather lust for women or would you rather have women? So there's a distinct feeling difference between lust, want, need, crave, and having, and ultimately even having and being somebody who has women. So in the needing, you're trying to go out and get the women and the having it's it, you're allowing it in and it's coming to you. So can you identify the different feeling between needing, craving, lusting and the feeling of having in your life? Look at a place where you actually experience having you, you experience the having of something and notice it feels distinctly different in your body, the physical location, the qualities than the wanting, lusting, chasing and needing. And if you can identify those differences, and then keep welcoming up the craving, acknowledging the craving, not seeing the craving as bad, seeing it as a good pointer in the direction of your growth, it's something you're transmuting, and then start slowly dissolving all the energy and the craving into having. Don't get rid of the energy, move that big abundance of wanting, desire, craving energy, and move all that energy, like, like if you're pouring from one pot to another, I'm pouring on this pot to this pot, and, and this one's labeled craving, and this one's craving having, move all that energy into having and then let having ex express out your heart welcome and feel the sense of, of of wanting which is pushing out trying to get and having which is a feeling of it just being with you already and I feel that through your heart first most important through the heart the heart is the is the the, the, is the battery and then in the stomach and then in the turn on so i'm giving you instructions more than i'm doing a release with you uh, maybe we'll do one, uh, one video where I do a bunch of releases. Um, I think guys... the main thing in that question, Brian, is that uh, there's a vibe that he sees his reaction as a problem to be fixed. And you're just a human being having an experience. No, no. The, um, the craving, the neediness is energy. And that energy is what's going to move into the having. So if you don't have it, see a lot of people try to release it and then they numb themselves back down to apathy. Right. I shouldn't have this craving. I'm going to let it go. And then boom, they get heavier. And that's the wrong direction. You should be getting lighter. Right. So the energy, you don't want to repress that energy. You want to let that energy up and move it into having out of need. Like the energy is a springboard rather yeah. than something to be battled against. Yeah. A burning desire, like Napoleon Hill talks about a God given desire when associated with pleasure, feeling good, naturally moves into choice and ultimately having the sense that I'm going to make this happen. Yeah. Um, but when you associate it with pain, it naturally moves down into grief and then a fear, grief, and, and apathy. So, um, um, Raul, hey, buddy. What, what's up, Raul Mendez? 
What are uh, ways uh, to practice focusing on consciousness to attain the 1% growth shift or movement? Hmm. I mean, I just gave the candle one. Uh, I mean, I'm not sure what that, the question's a little confusing to me. So I'm thinking about meditation, releasing, candle meditation, movement. These all expand your consciousness. And each one of them gives you 1% growth. So there's tons and tons. There's not one. Uh, but those are, those are examples. Do you want to add any? I think it comes down to what he perceives consciousness to be or what, because consciousness in front of like the small consciousness is still filled with self-defeating thoughts and, and resistances. Um, so can you be your own loving observer of your experience? And then, and that is the, that's the, uh, the umbrella that you want to be under. I think you just nailed it for Raul because the, the practice I give to people that can't stop wanting, chasing, or trying to find an answer is and i've given this many times is to spend one month observing without changing anything if something changes on its own that's fine but just practice welcoming and seeing every experience they have is good and 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 just welcome it even if it feels bad welcome the fact that it feels bad and just keep welcoming welcoming for a month straight if there's shifts great and uh that tends to help people break they're really stuck that tends to help people break out of the stuckness um is that the way you saw it sam yeah, I like that too. Yeah. Okay, Dan. As long as that observance is from a loving place as opposed to a critical place and it's sneaky. Yeah. And so you even have to love the pain and welcome it and, and nurture it and say that there's something in this for me, a lesson, something deeper. And I don't need to know what it is right now. It'll come when it's ready. Yeah. I love that. Love it. Daniel, uh, what's your take on how uh, did the consciousness start to exist? Is there anything behind it? I think it's always existed. And I think it's just constantly expanding into new experiences, which have all already happened and we're just realizing it. I know that sounds like a mind fuck, but that's the way it is. Well, in quantum physics, they have this uh, theory of plasma. Plasma is the energy that is in between things. And plasma has always been. So if plasma has always been and is everywhere, then plasma is consciousness, which means we're part of a uh, quantum uh, physical world of uh, energy and consciousness so it's all the same yep and and in, and in quantum physics and st and and stuff like that they they say that the human brain can't comprehend forever so they're always trying to find a way to uh to quantify forever but you can't quantify forever or infinity and so there's this idea you've existed in infinity but how long is infinity infinity no but but if i get out and no no you don't get it <laughs> but 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 and and because that, that's a real mind fuck because they don't know how to quantify it or even understand it at a deep level. They want to always put it into a measurement. They can quantify it mathematically, but they can't quantify it literally. Um, so there you go. Plasma. I like the idea of plasma though. You know, there's, there's this idea that empty space has more energy than matter. It has tons of empty energy that's just insane amount. I, I had the equation somewhere. I don't have it in front of me. I thought I'd say it. Well, I looked up the other day. What is, what is the Holy ghost? I thought, I always heard of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost is just the energy that connects us to the divine, which means the Holy Ghost is plasma, is consciousness. It's an interesting thing. In, in quantum, not in quantum, in the Course in Miracles, I believe the Holy Ghost, is it the part that helps us to, um, to uh, move from one level of consciousness to another? Therefore, it is the part that helps, that bridges the gap and creates the miracles that we can't, consciously perceives ourselves to move us to a new level. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's okay. um, Sean, uh, so by releasing, we can eventually tap into source energy to transform our reality. Well, yeah, releasing, meditation, movement, energetic modeling, all of it moves you in that direction. You wanna say anything? Yeah, keep going. Um, Okay. Hey, Brian. Daniel, you are just a talker today. Uh, <laughs> I started learning more and believing the law of attraction a bit less than a year ago. Uh, 
Uh, however, now part of me is fearful when I have lower emotions or when I stay in a low state for large periods of time. When I have fear I'll get cancer, then I'm even more scared because I believe my fear draws it in. So my emotions are dangerous and can harm me. I've been doing releasing, but still find this an issue. Can you comment? I'll let you take it. Do you want to take yeah, it? I got it. I definitely have a take on this. Is uh, I realized it was something that I was doing in my releasing is, uh, first of all, I was approaching releasing as something I needed to get rid of something. And that's no, that was a mind fuck. And then I realized, and this sounds like you are trying to release fear back into fear. You're releasing from a fearful place into your fear, and it's creating a vortex of, uh, and, and it just keeps fulfilling itself, makes the fear more real. Can you release on the fear from a higher place, from the love or acceptance or courage that you have in you, even if the you were asking this question, there was courage in asking this question. So, you, so can you access and release up into courage or acceptance or peace rather than back down into fear? That's exactly it, yeah. It's all about, Lester talked about this a lot in the beginning. <clears throat> you know, he isolated love and every, every release was to experience more love. So releasing me is not the doing of something like you just talked about, Sam, it's the doing less. So in reality, what I'm, I'm going to actually, I got a whole new way of teaching and releasing. I think I'm not even going to call it releasing anymore, but think of it as revealing or uh, recognizing. Mm. So it's this idea that I'm going to recognize the divinity in my heart. I'm going to recognize the divinity uh, or the, or the consciousness or the love or God or, or courage, whatever you want to say. Um, in uh in my ability to even handle fear and i'm going to put that and, I, and i'm just going to sit here and welcome mm -hmm. reveals i'm going to reveal reveal a little more a little more i'm going to release as the reveals happen i'm going to let go of whatever is not a greater experience of love i'm going to let go of, and then i'm going to keep expanding the experience whatever you're focusing on love god uh courage for me i love focusing on god i love the word god god to me is love i can mm -hmm. i can more love by focusing on God than I can the word love. So I use that a lot. Um, that feels like curiosity. That feels like deep curiosity. Yeah, it is. Curiosity it's, is devoid of judgment. Say that again. Curiosity in and of itself is devoid of judgment. You can't be curious and be judgmental at the same time. Curiosity just totally activates the law of attraction too. You know, it's such a powerful activator. Um, uh, I have a deep fear of being replaced. This is anonymous. Looking up back on my past relationships, I find that I have pushed the women in my life into the arms of other men. This happens to a lot of guys. And a lot of women do this to guys too. When I was 13, my mother left my father for another man. And I don't think he ever really recovered from that. Do you have any suggestions on stopping this pattern? Releasing. Uh, realizing you know you got to welcome up and, and look at all these deep emotions and stories and start breaking up all the component parts and letting it go but um and that can be done through meditation or releasing and i think releasing is one of the best tools do you want to say anything yeah it just sounds like um he has taken on his father's reality and implemented it into into his uh and it's really subconscious too yeah it's not gotta... i mean rationally you can say oh i'm not my father but there's something in this that you have Take it, that you've taken on and needs to be released. Yeah, you got to welcome up all those feelings and emotions and they're going to hurt for a bit. You'll probably go through some grief, through some sadness, and that's what has to be released. But if you're not willing to feel it, you can't release it. And then you got to have an awareness of where you're going. That's part of releasing too, experiencing more courage and love and peace or God or whatever you want to call it. Make sure when you do this deep work, that you, get your open first. you get an experience of feeling connection to something and then start doing the work. It'll be easier. Um, Miklos, I, I think I'm saying it. And I did see that Dan, it's a different Daniel that asked me that question. He put that comment in here. Um, Miklos, what meditation do you guys do? If you take the blue pill, everything will be the same. What about the red pill? Same, but strawberry taste. What do you want to say? I think that's kind of funny. I don't really know what it means, but it made me laugh. You've seen uh, the Matrix. By the way, the, uh, yeah. 
Yeah, okay, I just want to make sure. I was reading in a book about what enlightenment feels like, and the writer said, enlightenment is the feeling of getting a joke. <laughs> Good answer. And it, it's really great, and you can feel that when someone, if you're a stand-up comedian, all of a sudden you just, the way the story comes together and it sparks this, and it comes out of laughter, that's what enlightenment feels like. It's yeah. that delightful confusion for a moment. And how can you take that delightful confusion and just extend that and keep it building and building and building off of that? And in the end, it was it, part of the joke is it's also obvious and simple. Yeah, it was right in front of you. Yeah, the whole time. The joke goes one way, it tells a story that takes you this way. And what makes you laugh is that the story does a quick reversal and goes this way. So exactly. it blows your mind. Yeah. There's, the, there's the polarity part. Um, so there you go. That's a Zen cone, buddy. That's there, there, one answer. Um, what, um, so what, what, uh, what do you do to take the red pill to wake up, laugh, just laugh, <laughs> humor. Even meditating on the thought, if there's a, what is the, what is a red pill is liberating. Like, yeah. How can you see the matrix if you're in the matrix? Well, you have to design a life that's outside the matrix and meditate on that. Yeah. You got to get in touch with infinity to be able to see beyond everything. Mm -hmm. And there's a law of relativity in action. Um, personally, you know, I, I we keep saying it over and over. I do a lot of releasing. I do some meditating. I do uh, a lot of I do some energetic modeling. Uh, do some movement work where I will learn to explore and release my body. So these are the things I do. And there's lots of videos on on the YouTube channel. And, and, uh, and for you guys that are at, curious about releasing, look at, uh, we have a video on it. We did a couple of days ago. So on the basics, we're probably going to do some more here coming up. Might even do a whole program on it coming soon. So if you guys want that, uh, if you guys want a program on releasing in the next month or so that we can do online for you guys, like a more hardcore one than the little video I did for an hour, like, or maybe over a few days or something like that write yes in the comment section and um and we can talk about that too that one will have a, a nominal fee but it won't be expensive it's going to be a, a serious commitment of time oh i uh, do have a practice uh I, that i've tried before which is uh can i be as stupid as possible <laughs> i walk around i've done this a few times right. but i walk around the world and the only sound in my head is do 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 and just like be a stupid, like, what if I knew nothing? And it's really I liberating. I think that's a great, because it gets you so outside your, your need to be perfect and right. And yeah. You so you ask questions like, oh, look at that leafy thing. I wonder what they call that. You gotta, take it, no, no, no. <laughs> you gotta take it a step further and talk to people stupid and, and act in front of people stupid and get things wrong and make that mistake. And Oh yeah, I did that for uh, like three days. Talk to girls from a stupid place. I found they came around the corner and I would a girl would walk up. I go, oh, hot. <laughs> uh, and we'd have this really electric, tension filled conversation. Nice. I had no thoughts in my head at all. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Perfect. Uh, I love all the yeses, guys. The, the, the releasing class yeses. Thank you for putting that in there. Uh, sign me up right now from Monik. Uh, we're really excited to, to start bringing you more online content uh, since we can't leave the house. Um, and even afterwards, we'll probably keep bringing it to you. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Michael wrote, Sam, Sam that is awesome. You're gonna go out and do it today, Michael? Uh, you're gonna go out and, or tomorrow or whenever you can, or even, even from your house, you know, just play stupid. Come on, I used, Michael, it's time to get stupid. I used to tell people to get over the fear of being wrong, because a lot of guys come to us and they have such a fear of doing something wrong, being embarrassed, they don't wanna be embarrassed. Go do stupid things, and, and exactly what you just said. And one of the things I told them is like, go to that the beach, it's right up the street from here, go rinse some rollerblades and then put the rollerblades on the wrong feet and then <laughs> rollerblade over to the, the, the tendon or walk over and say, these don't, these don't fit right. And I don't, you know, they don't work right. And then let them tell you and don't tell them what you do. Let them correct you that you got them on the wrong feet, feel the embarrassment, feel the shame, feel that, you see what I mean? And then, and then and notice what that's like. And then you can duplicate that behavior a ton more times with different activities and you'll start to get over your fear of what people think of you. Um, uh, take care, Brian. Have a good one. Um, okay. Like, 
Oh, what do you guys think of human design? Are you talking about intelligent design? When you say that, I'm not sure what you mean by human design. Intelligent design, which is like the idea that there's a God behind everything. What do you think? No, that's a, that's a, it's a field of study. I don't know anything about it. Yeah, I don't know it either. I thought maybe, maybe it's not the same as human intelligent design though, right? The field of study. Yeah, I don't know. Okay. Um, I, how do you connect to the feeling level of your dreams and desires to bring it into reality without forcing it and without your brain hijacking the whole process? I ask because sometimes it's hard to connect to feeling of your desire without forcing it. That's an embodiment issue, Mike. That's what I see. What do you want to say? Mm, yeah, it's an embodiment. Yeah, without your brain hijacking. Yeah, it's, you know, talk about meditation. Uh, I, I just meditate on my body. That that's the simplest yeah. thing. Something I can feel rather than something power now. Blanking now. Power now. He talks a lot about feeling your body. Um, movement work, yoga. You get a really good yoga teacher that actually teaches real feeling through the body and not just stretching. Yoga is not about stretching. It's not about fitness. It's about moving a part of the body and and maybe just gently stretching it enough so you can feel all of the energy and the and the sensations in it and exploring that at a deeper and deeper level. In yoga, it doesn't matter if you ever get flexible, to be honest. That's not the point of yoga, this perfect posture or any of that stuff. That's that's what people have turned it into. So learn to feel your body. And as you get more and more feeling in your body, you're actually letting go of your attachment to your body, attachment to how things are supposed to be. That's all the stories store all through the body. That's the chemical response. You see, the body is constantly, the hypothalamus pumping chemicals in the body that cause you to feel different emotions. And then the cell receptor sites get addicted to those chemicals. And then they want them every day. And so then they produce thoughts to get you like, like if you're used to being angry and they're used to getting chemicals that make you feel angry and the cells are now addicted like caffeine, then every day you're going to start getting angry thoughts to try to get more of that chemical to come down from the hypothalamus, in it, basically uh, hypothalamus to the, is it the, what's the next point? But whatever, it comes down and pumps that chemical into the body. And then, and then the cell receptor sites absorb that because they're wanting it every day until you break the addiction. And... And so, um, so that's what you really got to do is undo all of that. Now, what happens is if we don't want to feel all of that stuff and we don't like feeling it, then we start learning to communicate from our head and disconnect from our body because we don't like all those sensations that are going on in the body. We literally become, there's the body having its feelings and then us up here being practical and analytical and not connected. So that's what you got to break up. So uh, movement work, we have a whole movement programs too um, for this stuff that's really designed on the focus of feeling and not getting lost in the, uh, getting a perfect movement. Um, okay, Daniel, now it's you, Daniel. I found out about Wim Hof yesterday and wondered, you know of him? Yes, and here you go. Uh, yeah, Wim Hof, is, his work is fascinating and it's interesting and uh, I've been meaning to actually take some of his work. Uh, he, he's a big pusher, man. He's like, you watch him in videos, he's always pushing, but boy, he really knows how to work that nervous system and, and pump the adrenals and the co control the cortisol and the, and it's just amazing what he can do with his body. So I have a lot of respect for that, man. Um, so, uh, you want to say anything? No. Okay. Dom. Hey buddy. Uh, do you have a suggested reading around the area? We just gave a whole list, right, of books, quantum physics books uh, that we knew of. And then somebody on here recommended uh, somebody that he thought was great, which I want to look into. Uh, we'll, we'll sort through the uh, chat. Uh, and if anybody had any recommendations, we'll pull them out and post them for you. Yeah. Um, okay. Josh wrote in here, for anybody interested in the releasing program Brian talked about, shoot me an email at josh at thefearlessman.com. So there you go, guys. Get that email out, and uh, if you're all the people that wrote yes, and he'll, he'll get you the information. Um, okay, hey Brian and Sam, my name's spelled with an I, buddy, not a Y, but the Y looks nice. It's very fancy, so I appreciate it. Uh, <laughs> sort of a metaphysical question, uh, but what are your views on spirits from other dimensions, angels and demons and entities? Curious about your guys' point of view. I say, why the hell not? <laughs> I had my Akashic record done about six months ago. It was the most fascinating journey about what dimension I came from. And it just, it, it's so interesting how these things, when you keep an open mind, start reverberating across other things that you've learned about yourself. Supposedly, according to this, I am a parallel, which is sort of unique. I'm here 
from a parallel dimension and I'm here as a, like a tourist. She said, well, you're here to enjoy yourself like a tourist and bring whatever knowledge you have and take knowledge back. She said, life is really simple. I went, oh, God, that feels so good. Do spirits exist amongst us? Absolutely. Can I see them? Not yet. I love that you said yet. <clears throat> There's an interesting thing. Um, and I, I, what you just said is fascinating because it's uh, – because I, I, I really, I, be, I believe that all that stuff, there's many planes of existence. And is, if our consciousness can perceive, conceive it, then it probably is there. Um, then it is there. Now, that does that mean I, <clears throat> I spend all day wanting to talk to spirits? No, I'm, I, I'd rather just connect straight to God, meditate on God and God and consciousness. And, and that's where I get my, my that's what I want to go to. That doesn't mean the spirits aren't there or aren't, but I, I just want to, I want to, because I feel like that's going to move me the fastest. Now. Does that mean that this the spirit world or I, I reject it? No, not at all. Uh, and I don't think I, there was an interesting thing I saw on the uh, what the belief yes, uh, yesterday, where Doc and you will probably remember this, Sam, where um, Doctor Quantum was talking about the two D world, and he's in a three D world and he's floating above the two D world and he puts his finger into the two D world and they're freaking out. Oh, what is this? Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. He starts talking to the little dot in the two D world and then telling the two D world and the two D world the little dot's going, "Are you a ghost?" And he's like, no, I'm just in another dimension. I'm not a ghost at all. I just live in a dimension you can't understand yet with your level of consciousness. And, and when you can understand it, you'll be able to see me. And so I want, and he goes, and then he asks her, uh, and then she's like, why well, are you a God? And he's like, no, <laughs> I'm just another person in another dimension. Do you want me to show you what the 3D consciousness is like? And they're like, yeah. So she pull, he pulls on the dot and pulls her out of the 2D world into the 3D world and becomes a ball from a dot to a ball. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then there's this whole like, wow, look at all this. Well, that's what waking up is. And that's as you become more conscious, I think you start to perceive more of these realms and you start to see, like literally as I become more conscious through tons of meditation, I see the exchange of energy, energetics, all these subtleties I've never seen before. I can do things with my touch that I never thought I'd be possible of with other people. I've been able to heal stuff on people with touch, all kinds of stuff. Who says that's gonna stop anytime soon? Uh, Lester Levinson used to talk about being taught by and, and seeing uh, uh, entity, entities, beings that were disembodied. But he says to him, he says, at first you start seeing them as hazy and you get these little experiences. Then you start seeing them as a little like see-through. And then eventually they seem like solid people in the room. Uh, Swami, Swami uh, Nichananda, not Nichananda, Muktananda, was it Muktananda? Rudananda said he was taught by Swami Nichananda out of body. He would come because he passed away. He'd come and sit in front of him and teach every day. Uh, I had another teacher, um, Sheikh Salik, who would uh, who would who would say, "Oh, so and so just walked," and he would see these, and he would talk about the same thing. Is any of that true? I don't know. I'm not having their experiences yet, but could it be true? Sure, why not? I'm open to it. Um, okay. Um, how can we meditate to manifest the reality that I want? Like brain uh manifested people giving him brian excuse me he wrote brain like brain brian manifested people giving him water um do you want to say anything you did it you did it with the with the woman i mean we've done it we've done it a bunch of times a lot of students have it happens all the time but yeah um it's uh it's really it's confoundingly simple is where you imagine in your, I gave a brief description, I'll repeat it, is that you do create an image in your, in your mind of what you want to create. In Brian's case, it was someone giving him water. Now, it's one thing to have it live as a daydream in your head, and that doesn't really change anything. It just sort of feeds on itself. But as you let it drop down your throat, down to your heart, and you can feel it fill up your entire body as if it's happening in that moment, and you meditate in what the feeling of that is, you're going to start vibrating from a certain frequency that's going to attract people giving you water. It's as simple as, as that. Uh, uh, releasing on, on the resistances that come up or not giving them any meaning and, uh, and let that come to life. You can walk around and feel people giving you water. Imagine what, what's the weight of the water, how cold is it? You can make it real and then it will show up in reality. Okay, that's a really good answer. Um, and if you guys, if you wanna learn more about it, check out the uh, releasing program that we're gonna do at some point and get into that, because I'll actually teach, I'll take you through a walkthrough in that program of this. Um, 
the energetic modeling. Uh, you can also, uh, that book I recommended earlier, Feeling is the Secret by Neville Goddard is a great mm -hmm. resource for that too. And so yeah, you can find it on YouTube, 45 minute book or get download on Audible or something. Super, super short. Um, anonymous, so we'll see if we can get through the, to, I'm not gonna go beyond the 27, maybe we'll do some short answers and just run through these. Yeah, things. let's do some short answers. I've uh, been releasing on coming out of apathy, but facing a lot of neediness and, and clinginess, especially with women, and don't seem to be able to release on that. Also, have you ever felt physically sick from releasing? Yes, I felt physically sick from releasing, and then it gets worse, then it gets better, and that's happened to me. Uh, do you want to say anything? I think he's releasing from apathy back into apathy. Yeah, that's it. It's, it's just getting stuck down there. So invite up, invite up some sadness that's usually the first thing that pops up be curious about the sadness within the apathy yeah i think you're trying to release to get rid of and you need to and i would do a little bit of period of welcoming too just welcoming 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 and then all your releases practice them not on them doing when you start releasing again don't do do a release allow a release so practice this take an object hold it and then as you release just practice relaxing till your whole body relaxes with the release and you're looser and then the next time, feel the release, embody, like there, 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 I'm tight. I'm tight right here. I'm going to tighten my hand to equal that point that I'm tight. Like, let's say it's in the heart. And then I'm going to relax till that all loosens. This loosens with the hand. And I keep doing that over and over till the release becomes a, 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 a relaxation rather than a doing. Um, um, any suggestion on manifesting the perfect relationship with the perfect woman? Is it more mind-like imagination or is it more feeling like old memories of interactions with women is it both i'll let you take it yeah we touched on actually we this actually we might have asked already answered this uh, question yeah. um the old memories of interaction with women that sounds like it could be fraught with uh with all sorts of uh heavier emotions so i don't know what your old memories of women are yep i would say let all those old memories go and create something new yeah i like that even if they're good memories, let them all go and then allow your mind to create something new and just imagine what it looks like and picture it every day right before bed and fall asleep to it. Um, get as many good feelings in it as you can. Uh, in the book, Letting Go, the writer says, that's David Hawkins, in the end that by releasing anxiety and other lower emotions, he was able to correct his vision. Um, why do you guys still have glasses? This is the second time I've had this question this week. And you're not the and, and the other one was Jonas and he I think he sent me an email about it I need to respond to that um, and do you want to answer it I got it I don't think it's I don't see it as my wearing glasses is uh, any is not limiting so I don't really worry about it you know it's it's an interesting question because like uh, I had a I had a teacher a hypnosis teacher and he was fat and he did a lot of weight loss hypnosis and he was really fat and you would ask him why don't you lose weight and he says because I don't want to. She says, I love eating and I'm not going to give it up. I eat a lot. <laughs> and I was like, that simple. Uh, now for me with glasses, I do want to correct my vision at some point, but it's not, um, it's not important on right now. I have way more important things to release on and you can't do everything, but you can do anything. So what I work on is the things that are like the top five things that are most important, four things, three things. And, and as I correct one of those, then I'll move to the next thing. And honestly, vision is one of the less important things. Um, I'll get to it. I have two books and training materials on how to correct my vision and I've got YouTube videos saved and meditation. So it's, it's on my list. Um, super excited to get to it, but time wise, uh, I, uh, I, I'm, it's not high enough on my list yet to, to invest the time in it. Um, okay. Hi guys. I feel pain when I release in my heart and when I release, I try to see the memory behind it and release on it. Do you have more advice on releasing the pain better or my, or my more insight? I always get the little alarm bell goes off when people talk about trying to see the memory. It feels like you're asking why. If you could figure out the why behind, you know, the memory will give me clues as to why I'm feeling this in my heart as opposed to just welcoming the feeling in your heart. And maybe like John, Brian was saying earlier, not even not with the intention of releasing, but feeling your heart, feeling your heart from a place of love and compassion for a heart which hurts. I agree. 
And, and if a memory needs to come up, it will come up on its own as you release and as you go through it. Don't go digging for it. Yeah. Um, the key is just to keep relaxing into it more and more. And even as you feel pain, don't make pain the enemy to be gotten rid of. Keep welcoming the pain as a friend that's here to protect you or teach you and you're getting into relationship with it. So once you're in relationship with it and you stop making it bad, then you can start releasing it. That's so a big part of heart and this idea of sadness that it's it's somehow it, it's you know bad. It's actually yeah. I've been playing around with what is the gift inside every every single emotion. And for me, I I hit on the the gift of sadness is the gift of connection with other people to really feel other people's uh, uh, um, sad, their sadness within them. It's it's not something you want to get rid of. It's really connected. The gift of the whole, that's part of the gift of being human. The gift of the human body is the ability to feel apathy, grief, fear, lust, anger, pride, and use it as contrast to teach you truly what joy and happiness feel like and love feels like because through contrast, we learn. We come in here to have that contrast so we can become even better at feeling love, deeper and deeper understanding and more appreciation. And what's, you know, what's the gift of apathy? Protection. Like I said, if you're a little child in an abusive household, apathy can be the very thing that, that protects you and keeps you safe. And then later when you release it, you become really good at helping others release apathy. And, what's and, the gift of fear? Yeah. Fe uh, let's see. I came up with one. I want to hear what you say. But the gift of fear. Um, I would, the gift of fear is the intention is to protect you from, uh, from doing something. So let's say this is the intention behind it. The intention... And I'm not saying it's 100% it's right, but if I'm in primitive times and I don't have the level of consciousness to keep myself alive and I'm in a village, the fear is the idea behind the fear is to keep me from venturing too far from the village or doing something too stupid that would get myself killed yeah. until I develop the consciousness that I don't need the fear anymore and I can make the conscious decisions myself. But go for it. I think it's <clears throat> alertness, similar to what you're saying. Yeah. When you're in fear, everything is like you can feel everything. It's, it's an overload. But it's alertness. Without fear, we wouldn't have alertness, and certainly we wouldn't have courage, right? And if you if you really feel the fear and relax into it, it turns into courage. Yeah. And you move forward, and it turns into more and more courage. If you lose control and become reactive to fear, that's when you bring what you don't want into your reality—the very thing you're afraid of. And, but if you're proactive with the fear, you'll grow out of it into courage. Um, um, have you read the book Course in Miracles? Uh, what would you suggest around this? Read it. It's a great book. It's fantastic. Works perfect with releasing. I think everybody should read it and do the do the practices in the back. Um, and it, it really helps people to grow a lot. That's my opinion. What do you want to say anything? No, I'm just writing it down because I've never read it. Uh, it's a super thick book, like the Bible. Uh, I think somebody, somebody added more questions that we were going to stop at 27. So I'm not sure that 31 now one. Why don't we do a lightning round since we're getting. Okay. Um, what are the best types of yoga to do for embodiment? All kinds of yoga. It's okay. all about embodiment. It's all about the flow between uh, thoughts and feelings and your physical sensations. So if you do yoga, like Brian said, don't do it in order to uh, get into shape or become more limber do the deep curiosity about what would flow feel like between your mind and body. Yeah. If you want hard abs, go do something like Pilates instead. <laughs> um, okay. I found the humming. I found that humming and throat singing is amazing for embodiment and reconnecting with the body. I literally physically make myself uh, vibrate any thoughts, experiences. That's great for the throat chakra and to open up the throat chakra. I totally agree. You want to yeah, no, but humming and throat singing, you can feel when you're singing, you can feel an entire vibration. If you're really singing, you're deeply feeling a hum, you can feel it vibrate your whole body and wake up different parts of your body. Yeah, that's true. When we have people stand in front of each other and talk, you can feel how low in their body they can feel when they talk. Are they stuck here? Are they stuck here? Are they, can they go up and down in their body and express emotion at a range? Super powerful. So I'm glad you said that. That's a great insight. Um, I had once tried to allow toothache and that was a, one of the worst nights of my life that is when i got really afraid to even get close to some stuff uh any similar experiences and how did you do it uh, i'm not sure what he means but did you get the question yeah this reminds me of johnny soporno and his he's got a um 
uh, he has a, a medical, very rare medical condition, condition called painful fat. It's, it's a, there's a Latin word for it, where his fat cells are actually connected to his nerve cells. So he is whole body for his entire life is surrounded by pain. And what he, and it, this totally blew my mind when I took this in. He said, he finally came to the realization or an understanding around the, the difference between pain and the difference between pain and injury. And realized he wasn't injured. And once he realized that his response to this pain, he was responding to him as if he was injured, he, his pain levels went down precipitously. So every time I'm in pain, I just ask the question, is this just pain, which is a sensation, or am I injured? No, I'm not injured. But I tell you, what, that takes my pain right down into a level that my mind isn't reacting to it anymore. So I don't know about his, but it's, uh, I'm not sure that helps because it sounds like there might have been some resistance to the pain when you were doing it. Of the toothache. Um, that's perfect. I think it's great. I'm going to leave that right there for you. Uh, with that, what you said, Grant asked when the uh, self trust program is coming out. It's just something I've been playing with. Uh, but if you really, if you guys really want the self trust program, which I think is going to be a game changer for a lot of people, then uh, I'll take a deeper look at getting that out sooner. But I don't have a time frame right now. Um, and uh, I don't want to get too much into describing what it is right now because of the time. We're getting more and more questions coming in as we speak. So I'm going to end it right here. Every time I look down, there's more. Um, so guys, it's been over two hours. It's an awesome round. There's still 62 of you on the call with the not counting panelists. Uh, I really appreciate you guys staying on the call. I know this was, this this conversation was a total uh, mind fuck and we just went all over the place, but I, that was part of the fun of it. So yeah. did you say anything? It just goes back where we started, which is quantum physics and all this entire conversation is about possibilities. Yeah. And what you what you look at snaps your reality into a single point of focus. So can you open up, can in some way open up the possibilities of multiples of, of, uh, of um, possibilities for yourself? Nice. And I, uh, that's exactly it. I mean... As I get older and older, I want to become a more amazing manifester, not because I need things, more things. It's because I want to, you know, I might want to go out and help other people get things. I might want to go out, which I do. Um, I want, I might want to go out and help heal something or the better manifester I am, the more ease I can create in, in my life and other people's lives and help people to grow, which is why we're here is to constantly help each other to grow. Life is more. We're here to experience more all the time. And we're here to experience contrast. So, you know, experiencing fear helps you to experience courage and that helps you to experience more and helps you to experience a greater life. So that's why we're here is my, my opinion. We're here for life experience almost more than we're here for lessons. Um, and you and I are here because it helps us grow too. Exactly. Yeah, very much so. Helps us grow. And then in your us, the reflection of you tells me a lot about where I'm at, how you guys reflect back to me too. That's because I mean, you are guys are all a reflection of who I'm being and vice versa sam's a reflection of who i'm being and i'm a reflection of who he's being and he's me and i'm him and at the deepest level it's all we're all one at the at the what do they call it the zero point field or the zero point yeah, yeah. Well, unified unify field or zero point field depending on who you talk to um so guys um thank you you beautiful ball grounded men <laughs> awesome with glasses and uh and guys uh, if you can get your question answered and you got more questions, make sure to put it on Facebook and get it out there. Um, make and sure if to you guys want to hit me up on uh, email. I'm Sam P S A M P at the fearless man.com. We can keep the conversation going. So Sam P if you're interested in the uh, program uh, for the uh, releasing program, uh, we're going to do like a fearless man live releasing online program, possibly uh, hit up Sam, hit up Josh, hit up one of your, the coaches, uh, get that going. So uh, get if you need to uh, have any other questions you want to put on the Facebook page, please put it on there today. Get it out there. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll get to that. Uh, make sure to comment. Make sure to like wherever you're seeing this. If you're seeing this in Facebook or YouTube, show, throw us those likes. It really helps with the algorithm. Make sure to share, too. Um, the shares are huge for getting more people in here and helping more people, getting the conversation a little bigger. Um, also helps with the algorithm. It gets more out there. Um, Make sure to subscribe and, and hit that uh, notification bell too if you haven't done that. And if you're on YouTube, and I think that's it. Anything else before I close it out? I'm good. I'm done.
have a beautiful day and uh, enjoy the sun, rain, wherever you're at. Here it's rain. And remember, only the confident really live. Take care. Take care, guys. Thanks. <laughs>